Welcome to the Broken Pie Jar Podcast, episode 94. I'm your host, Derek Moore, and today we have longtime semi permanent uh, co host, CEO of Sega Financial, Jay Pestricelli. Jay, how are you doing today? Good, Derek. Thanks for having me back. As always, I, I, I'm honored if you call me semi permanent co host, I think. Something like that. It's, I think I'm going to take the positive on that. Yeah, it's it's all positive, Jay. Uh, <laughs> as as you know, uh, as an emerging podcast, we're starting to get outside interest from uh, no advertisers yet, but we are getting uh, uh, guests on. We we may have a, a, a guest on next week. Uh, tune in next week for that. But yeah, so it's good to have you back on. And uh, rather than do uh, seven hours on post election stuff, we'll just stick to sort of the markets. And I think. One of the themes, Jay, and and I'm going to title this, I think, you know, you don't need to climb the wall of worry is a lot of people right now are looking at valuations. They're looking at the construct, let's say. I guess we do got to talk about politics a little bit, but the construct of the House or the Senate or the presidency, you know, any number of these things. And they're starting to get worried, kind of like, you know, should I should I get out of the markets? Um, first of all, Jay, the, the wall of worry is, you know, typically the markets, right, Jay, are going up, but people worry more and more as the markets go up more and more, right? Yeah, it's almost a, a, a contradictory set of terms, right? When you're climbing the wall of worry, people you would usually associate, you know, being worried in the market with the markets dropping. But uh, this is a real thing. This is a dynamic, although I don't know if there's a you know, mathematical definition of what it means to climb the wall of worry. You and I have seen it many times in the markets where despite there being a lot of fear and potentially damaging uh, market events on the horizon, the market still, you know, slowly but surely moves up and to the right, it means it climbs up higher. Yeah, and, and newsflash here, the markets over time go up, right, Jay? I mean, it's like... <laughs> really, they do, they do, I've heard that. No one has ever written a book, uh, or none that I know of, uh, you know, short and hold, like sell the market and hold. It's always buy and hold. And we, we have issues with buy and hold, we'll get to, but um, it's not a long-term strategy for, for sure. But, so I would call it short. You know, we, one of the, the classic sort of ways that people evaluate markets, let, let's kind of start here. So what are the worries that people are, are citing for getting scared? Maybe some people not getting in or going to cash. One of the the first ones I guess we can talk about is the idea of valuation. And I don't know about you, Jay, but there have been prognosticators who have said a crash is imminent. You should go to cash. Like if you listen to all those people, you probably missed out on on a lot of upside. But the market valuations right now, and and I'll let you kind of start here. Um, we have something called what the forward PE, which is the price over the expected earnings. So, you know. Is it crazy high right now, Jay? Well, it, I mean, it's it's certainly elevated and it's higher than it normally is, uh, right? And and essentially, this is used by fundamental an, uh, analysts to decide if the market is expensive or cheap. Meaning, are the stock prices, you know, higher than what they should be based on the profitability of the companies, right? And that's what that whole price to earnings ratio means. And quite frankly, yeah, we're in the upper end of that of the range, right? Uh, uh, last I saw, we're kind of over the the, the twenty mark, and uh, on average, I think the average PE of the S and P is around what sixteen, Derek. Um, and so, you know, generally speaking, yeah, a fundamental investor would say the markets are expensive right now, and it has a lot to do with the fact that markets stocks are pressing all time highs. As we're recording this, we might have actually been above the all time high close. Um, yet earnings, you know, arguably are going to be lower this year than last year because of the pandemic, right? And uh, Derek, you know, you, you've said this to me many times, what are the ways that PE ratios can come back in line? Well, either the P goes down, the price drops, I mean, the market values of stocks drop, or the E goes up, the earnings rise to meet the actual prices of stocks. And, uh, you know, historically speaking, one of those two things are going to happen. There's only two components to that ratio. And if we're going to be more in line with the historical price to earnings ratio of 16, either P has to go down or E has to go up. One of the things that, you know, us technicians, I say us, I'll include you in in our technical community, uh, technical analyst, of course, Jay. 
But it's, you know, we always say all the other stuff is just extraneous. We should look at price. We should look at trends. Uh, uh, markets going up until it's not going up anymore. And one of the things a uh, famous technician, Ralph Acampora, used to say is, number one is the E, uh, a lot of times is an estimate. Uh, price is not an estimate. Price is what it is. And so, you know, these analysts could be wrong. And I think, Jay, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, I mean, a lot of these companies are beating earnings expectations that were, were sort of lowered anyway by quite a bit. So do we even know what the earnings are going to be over the next year? Uh, I don't. <laughs> Certainly don't. And there's people that's whole job, whole life is to project what earnings are going to be on stocks. And, you know, it's, it's, it's rare that it's on the nose, right? I love that you call it an estimate there. It gets, it's not known until it's known, which is why earnings days are so important. You know, a lot of uh, fundamental valuation experts, and I'm certainly not, not in that camp, you know, they, the way they value a market or value a company is they, they look at either cash flows or they look at, the other way of doing it is you, you take the net income and you assume they're going to pay out most of the net income in either dividends or share buybacks. And Professor Jeremy Siegel, who you and I have quoted before, he was on CNBC. Uh, this is back in March. And he said, look, you can actually wipe earnings this year to zero and keep, you know, years two, three, and four, uh, some sort of a, a relative earnings estimate. But most of the value in a market or a stock is on its va- you know, long-term prospects, discounting those, those cash flows or earnings back to the present. And I, I wish I could find his example, but he literally said, what if we made earnings zero? And I'll leave this to their camp, but it, it wasn't that different on a valuation standpoint. And you're right, Jay, we, we, we don't know what's, what the earnings are going to be. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, uh, would you say this one's a little bit mixed and, and tough? I mean, we'll get to sort of the, the alternative to worrying about this stuff later, but this one's mixed. I would, I would say P.E. ratio is, doesn't necessarily present a bull case in the market in the near term. Uh, you know, there's, there's just as good a chance of the P going down as the E going up, right, to get us back in line with the 25-year average of 16 and a half. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say price earnings ratio does not paint a bullish picture. Correct. The other thing, and, and we'll talk about, so on this one, we'll talk about inflation. We'll talk about uh, bond yields, alternatives, uh, you know, hedging, a lot, a lot of different stuff. But one of the things that people use these P.E. ratios for, and, and people may be familiar with the, the CAPE ratio, which, uh, you know, or the Schiller P.E. ratio, which, of course, is you basically take uh, the 10-year uh, look back on earnings. You divide the price divided by the average of the last 10 years. I think that's the way they do it. And I think it was a, there was a piece or somebody forwarded this to me from Hussman uh, Advisors. And what they did was they tried to figure out, what if you had a 60-30-10? So instead of 60-40, 60 stocks, 30 bonds, 10 bills. So short, really short-term treasuries and 10%. Almost like cash, really, right? Yeah, it really is a cash. Uh, and so what they did was they said, what if we used a model and we predicted forward returns and then we looked at uh, forward 12-year returns, uh, and this is an annualized return, versus, you know, 1976, like, what do we say would be the, the next average 12-year return? Um, there's a graph, and obviously you can't see this, but it's uh, the estimated and the actual uh, subsequent 12 years were pretty similar. And I bring this up because in the middle of, of August, for that type of portfolio, this is them, not us, um, they were estimating the average annual return to be less than zero on that construct. And Jay, I think it was, it was on valuation, but it was also on the fact that you're getting nothing for your bonds right now. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, what, so let me say it a different way. What, what this data is telling us is that based on, uh, the past, the future looks like zero returns, uh, whatever the next, I think it's a 12 year, right? It's, it's 12 past versus 12 forward. Uh, the average should be forward returns should average about zero with that kind of a mix of 60, 30, 10. Yeah. And, you know, part of this too is valuations. Part of it is, and uh, if I could find it, I'll link to it in the show notes, but the uh, CFA, Certified Financial Analyst Institute, they had a, a research paper in years past 
And they said over a 10-year period, an investor should probably expect whatever the coupon percentage rate is as your annual uh, annualized return. So if, if uh, 10 years, 70 basis points or 0.7%, it would be reasonable for an, an investor over a long period to average that. Um, and you know, so that's that's one of the challenges there. I, Jay, I don't know if I this their past historicals look look pretty spot on. I will say, you know, after two thousand to two thousand eight, uh, the actual returns were were quite a bit above what the expected returns were. But um, this is definitely the bear case, I guess you would say. Yeah, well, right, for sure. And and you're right, there, there have been periods where the past did not accurately predict uh, the future. Um, but, you know, even in the most extreme case, when you look at the data, I mean, it's like maybe a 5% difference. And so, you know, even if this data is off by the worst it's ever been off, you're talking about maybe, you know, maybe 5% annualized returns uh, going forward. And, I, you know, I think w- when you're taking, you know, the risk associated with stocks, it's it's hard to make the case to be invested in a portfolio like this is 60, 30, 10 um, uh, when you're looking for returns and you have goals in mind. If your goal isn't growth, then OK, then you, that's this is fine for you. Most people invest for growth reasons, right? I think, um, you know, let me give the bull case for this and then. Yeah, because we're painting a pretty, a pretty, a pretty scary picture here so far. Dan. Yeah, you but I want to come back to this because it. Th- yeah, I know, but there's there's a really important part here, but I, I just want to do it. Uh, people may not believe we actually schedule <laughs> the topics we're going to talk about, but uh, let's come back to that bond piece because I think that will be important. The bull case, though, is there's actually a really good case for the bull side, and this is from uh, ofdollarsandcents.com uh, as a blog. Um, I'm spacing on the on the gentleman who, who runs it. Otherwise, I would of course credit him. But what he did was he said, look, um, he did a regression analysis. And that's just fancy for saying, can we see if there's any relationship between one thing to another? And he looked at the prior, uh, a bunch of different prior 20-year annualized uh, return uh, sets, right? So if we go back 20 years, we'd be, you know, the year 2000 through the year 2019. I know it seems like it's only 19, it's 20 total calendar years. And he said, you know, we know that there was a competent annual growth rate in stocks, believe it or not. It was only 6% because we had the financial crisis, we had the tech crash in there. But what he did was he said, um, when you have, uh, based upon the 20-year annualized prior return, what was the subsequent 10-year actual return? And what you see is, you know, if you were at 15%, annualized compounded growth rate over 20 years, um, you would expect less return going forward to 10 years. But what's fascinating about this one is we were only at 6% compounded growth rate. And so if you were to get a return that would fit along this regression line, and meaning it would, it would sort of cluster around the other areas, it would actually say the market's going to go up four times from what it was today. Uh, or at the start of the year, in the next 10 years. And if it only doubled, meaning a little over 7%, uh, it would be an extreme outlier to the downside. Jay, this is the bullish case, and people sometimes forget. And and this study looks at a 100% S&P 500 performance, right? There's no bonds in this, it's just straight up stocks. And you're right, the, 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 the outlier that uh, if you only doubled over the next 10 years, it would be extremely rare based off of the, you know, the historical data. So with just stock only, uh, you're right, Derek, this, there is a very strong bull case here to own, uh, to own stocks, right, over the next decade, right? Because even if you, you know, every dollar you had today, if it was going to be worth $4 in 10 years, and that ends up being really on the low end of the range of what the data has, has shown us. It's definitely a bull case for stock only. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, for, from this chart, and like I said, I'll, I'll try and link to it. And also, Jay, you and I did a, a short uh, video. I don't want to call it a presentation. We did a, a, a short thing. Uh, it'll be on the ZegaFinancial.com site. I'll link to that as well if people want to get a, a visual. So there you go, a little, little targeted promotion for our other thing, Jay. But uh, yeah, of course. 
But yeah, I mean, I think the message is, although over the last 10 years, we averaged 13.3%, over the last 20 years, we have not. And so this is definitely bullish uh, for sure. So, and, and this sort of goes back to not wanting to climb the wall of war, not worrying while you're on the wall. How's that? Um, because there's any number of ways that you can sort of look at future markets. I also think, Jay, that, you know, a lot of people look at the, the recession we just had. I guess we're out of the recession. Maybe we're still in it. I guess they'll tell us when we when we officially are out of they it. They officially but, tell you when when everybody knows what really happened, right? But yeah, it'll right. be like a year later, right? It, it <laughs> right. literally. Is. By the way, if anybody uh, thinks we're joking, there is a a committee. Uh, God, I can't remember what what the name of it is. I'm having a tough time remembering stuff today. But they they meet and they look at the conditions and they decide when there's a, a recession or not. And uh, I think. They said it was over in March of 2009, but I think they said it at the end of 2009. So, but Jay, market versus economy, uh, they're not exactly the same. In fact, you know, this recession was worse than the one in 08, but we didn't go down as much as we did in 08. No, uh, it was, it, I think it was probably quicker, but not as deep. I mean, the one in 08 lasted, what, almost 18 months. This recession, yeah. Happened very, very quickly. Uh, I think the quickest in, uh, in in modern history. And so, you're right. It wasn't as deep, but it certainly was quicker. I mean, look at some numbers here. Uh, at the worst of it, we were down about ten point one percent. I think in real GDP, we and these are in real GDP terms. Uh, Two thousand eight was only down four percent. Like, can you imagine if we said in March, "Hey, we're going to go down four percent." And you'd be like, okay, that's not too bad. It's, it is interesting to think that. It really wasn't that bad back in 08. It was different. It was a liquidity crisis, banking, yeah, a lot of different things. There was a lot of fear then, right? The fourth quarter of 08, you had a lot of banks going under, getting acquired because they couldn't cover their obligations, right? There was definitely some uh, fear that that would spread. Um, but you're right. The number, it's, I think there was more of a panic of what could happen versus what really did happen. Right. And we we needed the governor to bail us out back then as well, um, at least bail the banks out. We gave the banks a bad name for quite a long time. I do think that would prepare them for things that we uh, for, for scenarios like what we just went through. You know, I don't correct me if I'm wrong. I, I haven't heard of uh, any banks going any major banks uh, going under through all of this. Right. And uh, so you got to at least take your hats off to the uh, to the preparedness that they had whether they wanted to be prepared or not, but they were prepared for this kind of an event. I, I don't, I can't imagine any of the stress tests ever uh, put this kind of a scenario together, what we just went through this year, but uh, you know, hats off to the, to the large financial institutions managing through this so far. It's not over yet, but so far it looks like they'll make it through this. Okay. It's, I'm actually surprised. And that, you know, we do what we do and we're, for, you know, we're sort of specialists in the volatility and hedging and, and derivatives markets and things like that. I start to get a, uh, out of my realm when I when people ask me, hey, what about the defaults in commercial real estate? And thing? Or, but I would have thought that given the shutdowns and the businesses that, that sort of pay, uh, you know, on their leases to, to owners, or even, you know, I guess the other fear was the collateralized loan obligation market, which uh, that would be a separate podcast altogether, right? But um, yeah, Jay, you're right. We haven't really heard of anything uh, systemic in in the financial system thus far. Uh, but I guess it's only been since March. But yeah, it's it's different this time. And I also think, I don't know about you, Jay, but this recession, I've never experienced a recession where, hey, I know a recession's coming. Like, there's a train in the tunnel and I know it's a train because I can see the light. Normally, you know, this drops off, that drops off, you know, there's little clues, but this is pretty clear. This is different. Yeah, this was, this is definitely different than any recession I've seen in the 25 years I've been trading for sure. So let's talk about uh, one of the other fears right now, and that's that we're going to have a ton of inflation and, you know, inflation... Uh, back in the late 70s, early 1980, 81. I mean, it was something like, uh, you know, 13.5%. You could have bought a, 
a U.S. Treasury 30-year at 16%. Jay, as I've joked around with people, you and I have both written books. Uh, by the way, these are great. Uh, what's a Thanksgiving Day gifts? Thanksgiving Day gifts. Uh, Buy and Hedge uh, is a great book and uh, Broken Pie Chart. Jay also is going to be available in, uh, uh, I believe, in Mandarin soon. Yours is available in different languages though, right? Yeah, no, Mandarin. I think yours yeah. was, yeah. It was. It was Don't you think they're just tremendous? On yours Thank you, yeah. Don't you think, though, just tremendous Thanksgiving Day, you know, maybe lack of uh, smaller celebrations? Why don't you send them one of our books? Yeah, I mean, listen, if you're going to have some downtime uh, instead of, uh, you know, watching football, why not read a financial book written by you or I? I think that's a great idea, Derek. Tr- fantastic. But <laughs> so, Jay, one of the things is that uh, I'll let you start here. The money supply, you know, can you talk about like, number one, what are we talking about the money supply? And what's everyone worried about with all this Fed printing? Yeah, I mean, it seems like, hey, with all this printing of money, we hear this term printing of money. Um, I'm not sure there's actually a press that turns on and people just dropping money out of helicopters, but there is uh, all this money that is being created. And the money supply essentially is uh, reported to the Fed and it's a sum of cash and cash-like vehicles, right? Cash, uh, money markets, CDs, you know, how much money is out there in cash? Um, and uh, when you, you know, when you look at this, it has been a, on a steady slope up over the last 30 years. Yes, of course. And you can see when uh, there are recessions, the government does add to the money supply, right? Making it easier to borrow. That's one of the reasons they lower rates. They want companies to, uh, you know, to, to be able to uh, pay uh, for their obligations without having to, you know, be buried by higher rates. Um, well, this this time around, the money supply moved very, very quickly, very fast. Went from about seventeen trillion, uh, which was about where it was at the beginning of the year, to about twenty one trillion, uh, where we are now. Maybe it's a maybe it's a little higher. So that is a very, these are trillions of dollars that we're talking about, right? And that's what's out there. Um, I'm going to call it in cash and cash reserves. Um, and so a lot of folks would always say, "Hey, if you're going to print money." You're gonna create inflation, right? That's that's been the you know kind of the the, the understanding of uh, one of the things that drives inflation. But Derek, I think you're probably about to make a case of why that's actually not not going to happen. Yeah, and I'll I'll throw a caveat on here. Um, you and I have. I mean, it's one thing to predict the market; it's another thing to predict inflation. And but. There's this thing called the velocity of money, and that's just a really fancy way for saying, let's say, you know, Jay, you had a dollar and you go into your favorite pizza place and you buy a slice of pizza. I know it's not, it's cost more than a dollar these days, but I remember when it used to be a buck, right? So you give the guy a dollar, that guy takes that dollar and goes by and buys the Sunday newspaper at the newsstand. That guy uh, goes to the bakery and buys, you know, some chocolate chip cookies and, and so on and so forth. Velocity of money is how how many times that single dollar is involved in a transaction. And so how, how long is it moving around? And velocity of money is, I ran a regression uh, analysis and I looked at uh, the velocity of money and then I also looked at it with inflation. And the way you get uh, velocity is you take the nominal GDP divided by the, the money supply. And here I'm using MZM, which is near money, what the Fed uses. And what you find is, you know, when we saw velocity above, anytime it's been above three, and I think I only ran the data since the 60s, you know, we've seen inflation over 5%, you know, upwards of 14% or so. As inflation comes, uh, as the money supply, or sorry, velocity of money comes down, it tends to align with lower inflation. So in September of 2020, velocity was was essentially one. And if you line this up on, you know, on a regression line, what it's telling you is we really shouldn't have much inflation right now. And so the thought is if velocity continues to go down, that really actually points to deflation, not inflation, right, Jay? Yeah, I mean, Derek, it, it, again, it is a nice uh, defined range of dot plots where your velocity versus inflation tells us you're right. If you if your 
you know, again, velocity is just, you know, how much business is getting done versus how much money supply is out there, right? And you said it's about a one, right? GDP right now is about 20 trillion and the money supply is about 20 trillion, right? When you compare those two things together, you get a one, right? That's easy division. And you're right. If you were to, you know, go right along the average line, right? Kind of right along the relationship, this one-to-one relationship, or I should say uh, positively correlated relationship of velocity versus inflation, you could technically have deflation right now with this velocity uh, of one, right? Again, which is just how much money is being used, how often, right? And so inflate the, I think the theory behind this, Derek, and correct me if I'm wrong, by the way, hats off for your insight on you know, putting this data together. The theory on this is, hey, if it's okay, there's a lot of extra money out there. It's not changing hands nearly as rapidly as it normally does. Uh, and so there's less of a chance of inflation because there's just a lot less transactions than you would expect with this much money being out there. Is that kind of a fair way to kind of rationalize the results here? Yeah, no, I think it is. And it's, but you know, where where inflation has gone is to asset prices and the dollar has also been weakening. And Jay, I know you've been following a little bit of of the relationship between equities and, but if, if you believe this is true, wouldn't you also think this actually bodes well for stocks, especially if the dollar weakens? Yeah, oh, yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, it is. We are in. We are. This is not always the case, but we are in one of those periods where there's an inverse relationship between the dollar and stocks. Yes, a, dr- a, a loss in value of the dollar has been beneficial to stocks. Absolutely, and that is that is not. Uh, that, I mean, that is causal in some ways, right? We could talk about the whole rationale of. Why you know international dollars, uh, sorry, dollars spent internationally having less value end up driving stock prices higher. But you know all of that um, being said, it is it is it is it is not always the case where they are positively sorry inversely correlated. But today, the way the market has been the last few months, that has absolutely been the case. By the way, I, I should just mention you know you and I get we always have these conversations, but in the end, it all comes back to. Uh, which we'll get to a little bit later, the idea of just just be in the market, but be hedged. So, you know, we, like we never take positions of like, oh, I, th- I think the dollar index is going to go to 85, so I'll do X or Y, right? It's just, this is just the macro discussion. Um, but I also think the reason why we're talking about this, Jay, is that, you know, there's always something to worry about, um, but that worry shouldn't inhibit somebody from from sort of panicking, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, you've, we've made a bull case. We've made a bear case. I know we probably could talk more about bonds. Maybe that's for a whole nother, a whole nother day, Derek. But when, when you look at the, the markets, you know, the, 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 the approach, the, the concept of being invested, but do it in a protected way is all just a means of meeting client goals, right? We, we, we said this a minute ago, right? People don't invest to break even. People invest for growth. But there's a there's there's a target that you're delivering, and for a lot of folks, uh, they don't need to get a quadruple every ten years, quite frankly, right? As we mentioned earlier. Yeah. But you certainly can't get so conservative that you end up being invested, as you said, with the returns of what a ten year is at seventy five basis points. That's actually you know not going to help you hit your growth targets, uh, even with inflation as low as it is right now. And so you know you're right when you bring it back to what does this all mean for investing. These are data points as to help us understand what to expect. They help us understand how to construct our portfolios. But the concept of being, you know, protected uh, but poised for growth is is evergreen for us, right? That is something that we both believe in pretty strongly because over time, that's the way to meet goals. Let's talk about. I know we said maybe we'll save bonds for another, but let's let's have the bond discussion today because because I think it's. It's really important. It goes back to the thing we were talking about with the 60, 30, 10. It also, you know, a lot of times when people think about a hedging strategy or uh, they, th- they think about the 60, 40 and, and the idea is that you have 60% of the portfolio in stocks, 40% in bonds. And the theory is when stocks really get hammered in the really bad years, bonds provide a ballast for the portfolio and, and they can go up in value. Uh, part of the reason why they go up is typically you see, at least in, in the last you know, 20 or 30 years, the Fed lowering interest rates or just interest rates coming down in general. And so bonds get that uh, that pop. Interest rates go down, bond prices go up. But I got to tell you, Jay, I mean, right now, I think the risk in bonds has never been greater. And I also think the carrying cost 
of holding this in the portfolio, a lot of people are starting to question whether the juice is worth the squeeze. Well, I mean, how much juice is there really? Right? I mean, I you know, <laughs> Tetris paying 75 bips, and maybe it's paying 85 right now. Like it's, but it's less than 1%. And, uh, you know, it's it's having an asset like that in your portfolio because you think it's safer actually may end up preventing you from uh, uh, from 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 in, in enjoying growth of other asset classes. I mean, we we talk about this, and I don't want to assume everybody knows this, but as um, interest rates rise, bond prices fall, right? And when you have interest rates at you know historical lows, doesn't mean they can't go lower. Doesn't mean they can't go negative. We could, that's probably a whole different podcast, Eric. But uh, you know the, the 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 idea here is that if the economy recovers and rates start to recover, that's that's bad news. It's it's almost dangerous to hold bonds in those kinds of events. And and uh, you'll probably jump into this right away, but maybe dig into the uh, the leverage exposure that bonds have while rates are this low. Yeah, the the leverage, and we're not talking about buying bonds on margin. We're talking about what a bond gains or loses for a given 100 basis point, i.e. 1% change in, in interest rates. And bonds have something called duration. And it's confusing because you think, well, I just bought a bond and it, it matures in 30 years, so that's my duration. But duration is the estimated market change based upon a 1% change in interest rates. So let's say your duration is 8 if interest rates go up by 100 basis points, 1%, you would likely see around an 8% loss there. But I'll kind of explain this. Uh, if we go back and if we look at, let's say, a 30-year treasury bond, and when the 30-year had a 10% coupon, meaning you put $1,000 into it, you got two $50 payments, total of 100 bucks a year. Um, and by the way, after 10 years, in that case, in that example, you would have received your initial purchase cost back. Like you would have collected a thousand bucks over 10 years and you, if you put the thousand dollars in. But anyway, uh, so a 10% coupon, 30 year treasury, its duration was about 9.46, call it nine and a half. So if interest rates went up by, you know, 1%, you would expect to lose, uh, you know, roughly, you know, about nine and a half uh, percent there. Fast forward to today, you've got a 30-year, at the time I did this, at a 1.5% coupon. That means you're getting not $100 a year, you're getting $15 a year on your $1,000 investment in this bond, which means over 30 years, you'll never recoup your initial cost. Of course, as long as the bond doesn't you know, default, you get your $1,000 back. But the duration in that case is a little over 24, meaning if the market goes down, if, the, if interest rates go up by, you know, one uh, one whole percentage point, um, you'd expect to lose, you know, roughly twenty two ish percent, something like that. So, Jay, you know, when you talk about leverage, that's how they're leveraged. It means if you have an adverse move in rates, you could have outsized losses uh, for bonds that you know a lot of people probably don't even think is possible. Um, and then the other thing, Jay, is that. You know, when you when you think about, you know, just just bonds in general, you said it earlier. Like, how negative can rates go? Like, does the ten year go from 0.95 to minus nine five, uh, or or that would be a two hundred basis point, right? Or, or 0.95 to negative 0.05? Um, I don't know, Jay. I think I think there's high leverage in bonds from duration, and then what are you really getting paid to hold the asset? Yeah, and and uh, when when you think about how you have to let's let's take this to maybe a, a little higher level when you talk about when you build your portfolios, right? And you're thinking about how to allocate. You know, you're deciding to put money that could be in a different asset class into something that has this extremely high sensitivity to small changes in rates, right? And so, is it worth locking up money in a bond for you know ten, thirty years? Um, that's a, as you just said, probably never going to pay you back for the actual initial uh, investment. Uh, but B, that it carries all of this uh, uh, potential risk in the portfolio. Most people don't think that bonds can be uh, risky in a portfolio, but they absolutely can. And if interest rates really normalize at all, you just you just said it, right? You could lose 
uh, quite a bit on the underlying value of that bond in your portfolio, right? And so you got to, again, it's always, you think about, okay, where, where, where can I manage risk? And is that one of those asset classes that is going to start to be construed as a risky asset class? I know that's not conventional thinking, but you know, uh, it's something that you have to be, uh, you have to be really aware of, right? I know it's a little outside of normal, but, uh, for us, you know, adding, you know, having a, a portion of bonds to a portfolio these days, we just, you know, we find it hard to be worth the, 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 the time and is not the most efficient use of cash. You know, 1980, the coupon rate on the 10 year bond was 12.84%. Think about that. That's higher than the simple average on the S&P total return from 1926 well, that, that or 20. That's worth it. 12% bond rate. Yeah. worth it to me, Derek. But guess what, Jay? Big problem in 1980, rates went up 2.45%, so 245 basis points. Guess what the total return is that year? I know you know the answer. But, <laughs> but <it's>, tell us. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's basically minus 3%. But if you, if that, if you turn that into... Um, you know, the market value change was minus 15.83%, but because you got paid 12.84%, it dampened. It provided a, he- a hedge on, on itself because it paid so much in, in coupon. So, yeah, so your bond lost 15%, but you got 12% coupon, right? So you end up that's, with minus that's right. at the end of year. Right, right. But you had that cushion there, right? I mean, for your bond to lose 15%, yeah. you had that cushion. Um, but Derek, what we're talking about right now is you know, what, half that change in rate and you could lose, you know, almost that same amount in the underlying, but there is no coupon to offset that loss, right? You just said a minute ago, right? A 1% change in the 10 year could be a, what, nine, nine and a half percent change in the value of the bond, right? So if rate goes up 1%, your 10 year is going to lose nine and a half percent in value. That's what you should expect. And you're only getting 75 basis points. That is going to be a worse scenario than what even, you know, 1980 looked like by far. Jay, you you haven't seen this data yet, so you'll have to take my word for it. But I, I thought I'd bring it up because I just ran it. Um, I'll, I'll send this to you after, Jay. Uh, you can see the spreadsheet. But what I did was I, I looked at the historical, you know, 1928 through 2019, just the, the total return on, on if you just held a, a 10-year bond. So you bought a 10-year treasury at the beginning of each year. Like, what would you have made or lost, right? And historically, the, the simple average is about 5.15%, uh, standard deviation about, you know, 7.6. Okay. But then I ran a, a, a normal, distri- and, and are these returns normally distributed? You know, that's a different discussion. But just to give you an idea, uh, if you had the, the probability of the 10-year bond, owning a 10-year bond, the total return being, uh, you know, minus 10%, it's got a probability of that happening about 2.3%. And you know, the problem with this is I'm using all of the years when you had really high coupons, right? Um, but I think people could be, if we got some, and I'm not saying, I think there's an argument that rates will go lower, right? But if you got an outside move in bonds higher uh, in, in interest rates, you could see some historical, you know, standard deviation moves and returns of bonds that people just aren't expecting. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and so then it goes back to that question. Is it an efficient use of your of your cash? And have you do you really have a handle on what the risk could look like? We are, you know, bonds are at an extreme right now. So yeah, you have to just assess that. It's just like how people ask us, well, should I not buy the market while it's at an all-time high? Right. I mean, you have the same kind of a evaluation process and that you have to apply to to the bond market right now. Yeah, the good news is if you're if you're long 30 year treasuries. And markets and interest rates on the 30 year go down to like minus one and a half. That will be one of the, you know, that return will be really, really high because you've got uh, all that duration. So we, we don't know what's going to happen with rates. I, I want to bring this back to equities though. And I want to bring it back to, you know, what we do with hedging. You know, the the reason to have bonds is that they they historically have provided a ballast. They provided income. So you get paid to sort of hold the, the hedge, for lack of a better term, but at 75 basis points or 1%, which is a negative real return after inflation. I mean, a lot of uh, what we do is a little different than, you know, sometimes you hear about the tail risk strategies and, you know, this pension fund doesn't want to pay for tail risk insurance. But, you know, Jay, it's sort of like 
um, I'll have you explain this in the context of, let's say, something like buy and hedge retirement. But why not just be in all equities but have a hedge? Like if you, if forty percent of your portfolio um, is only going to get, you know, let's say one percent a year over the next ten years, I don't know if if it almost seems more expensive to hedge with bonds as it does to to hedge with uh, you know an equity strategy with using some derivatives or options. Yeah, and 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 the results I think would be a little disappointing, right? Uh, uh, if you were in say the 60 40 portfolio and the market the stock market dropped 30 35 percent so let's let's do some quick math here um if 70 percent of your portfolio is in stocks and 40 percent was in bonds market goes down 35 percent that 70 percent is going to be what about a 24 percent law overall loss um, let's say the other 40 percent which is supposed to be your you know offset your hedge your protection uh, what in this scenario, if there's a flight to safety and people are streaming into treasuries, if you had picked treasuries, forget about corporates, if you had actually picked treasuries, and let's say that those bonds are up what ten percent, right? And that's an area, so that's an addition of four percent to your portfolio. So you got a minus twenty four and a plus four. Your net is a minus twenty. I mean, did you really provide protection in that scenario? Right, a sixty forty portfolio, and that's if you got it exactly right. Is still going to experience a twenty percent drawdown during a during a market sell-off. And so, you know, we we would contend you're not really protected in that situation. But with the hedged equity portfolios that we talk about, the buy and hedge strategies, right, those are designed to not lose more than what, eight, 10 percent, I'll go to the higher end of that, in any 12-month period. And so when you can structurally put a hedge in that mathematically defines the floor in your portfolio, well, in those situations, um, you're, you know, you're going to help avoid the volatility associated with the stock market. You're still going to capture a good chunk on the way up. You know, Derek, what, what do we say in general, right? The cost of hedging with us ranges about two to four percent, depending on the market environment, right? And so, giving up two to four percent for locking in your losses, to, you know, your your equity losses to not exceed ten percent, um, is we believe is actually worth it because you're capturing a big chunk of the upside, whereas you know, with a 60, 40 percent, uh, 60, 40 model. Um, yeah, you're still going to capture some of the upside of the stock market, probably actually less than ours. But you still haven't done a good job of creating a hedge uh, with that bond portion. So, yeah, for us, we just think it's a more progressive way of investing um, uh, when you want to when you want to manage risk. The other one you always hear is, is you know, buy gold and stuff, although I, I'm seeing some stuff where people are starting to look at gold. Um, it's already moved so much. So has it? Already, have you already gotten the move for what you would buy it for now? I don't know. Um, and there's been historical periods. First of all, it doesn't pay a dividend, but there's been historical periods where, you know, you have underperformance. It, it really, it almost acts like a, a deep out of the money put option that pays off when it pays off, I think. Only every once in a while. And you're never going to have enough in it to actually be an offset, right? Yeah, it's great. I mean, if you add a, a 10% portfolio in gold, which I think would be considered high, right? I mean, that's 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 not normal, right? Gold this year has gone from 1,500 to 1,900. Let's just say it went to 2,000. I think we topped out just shy of 2,100, right? And so if your portfolio went from 15, the, the your portfolio of gold, your 10% gold, that went from 1,500 to 2,000, right? That means you've made, you know, 33%, but it's only on 10% of your portfolio. Right. And so, oh, great. I held gold for all these years. And when I needed the protection, it provided it and it made me three. Right? It's just it's is it really the right offset? You know, a lot of people would say probably not. And, you know, the other thing that people talk about is diversification, but that has its perils as well. Well, I mean, when we when by diversification, do you mean like, hey, let me buy some safe stocks, little Johnson and Johnson, uh, you know, sprinkle added to my portfolio to help offset some of the risk I'm taking in my Amazon or Apple, right? Well, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, I mean, well, well, uh, you might be diversified, but when you know, when all the when all stocks go down in an event like, let's say, the 08 sell off, or even what we saw this year in February, um, there was there was no safe haven in any stocks. I guess you know, eventually we figured out what the recession looked like. And, uh, uh, you know, tech stocks have, you know, p- positioned themselves very, very well. But in the midst of the fear, you know, everything went down, right, Derek? How, what about those days we were talking um, 
<laughs> just the futures market opened and it immediately limited down and they had to shut it down pre-market, right? The, the, everything just drops. So it, yes, diversification can help, but you know, uh, quite frankly, ugh, boy, I don't know. I, I hate to, to open up this can of worms, you know, protective stocks, you know, the value stocks, ones that are supposed to help provide diversification would be a cause of underperformance in your portfolio right now, right? Uh, so hard to even know where and when to pick those kinds of stocks, right? I, I don't know what the number is today, Derek, but uh, I know about a month ago uh, or just before the election, you know, while we were pushing, you know, close to highs and the market was positive for the year, something like 70% of stocks were still down for the year. And that was really value stocks. The ones that have the higher dividends, supposed to be more of a ballast, were underperforming. In general, right? I'm sure I could find a few that didn't. But uh, uh, in general, those more diversified, being diversified and protected with safer stocks didn't really pay, didn't pay off. Yeah, that's, that's a big debate right now uh, with regards to value versus growth and all those things. I mean, that's, um, and you're right. I mean, the, it, it's always, something's cheap for a reason, as technicians would say. There's some, and, uh, you know, value investor. Look, I mean, value performed up until about 2006. And ever since, I think it was 2006, Jay, that it's it severely underperformed. And that group has been, you know, really frustrated about it. Maybe, maybe value will come back when everyone just throws it away, you know, kind of like energy stocks this year, right? So, right. Um, right. Well, we, we know there is a rotation in performance by sectors. And one day value will be back on top. It's, doesn't seem, so it doesn't seem to be today. I think it does make an argument, though, of kind of how we view things. Of rather than pecking sectors, you just want to have the S. You want to own the S and P, and inherently, with the S and P, is you've got those value stocks in there. I mean, gosh, isn't Energy J like one percent of the S and P now? I could be completely wrong on that. And information technology, am I wrong on that? It's under five for sure. So, Jay, I mean, I think when we look at uh, the idea, getting back to the original thing, was climbing the wall of worry. Um, if you, if an investor, if an investor can kind of put away the emotions, uh, stay invested, get invested. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I heard from a lot of people before the election in 2016, <laughs> and I heard a lot of people from the election in 2020. Um, but it, it just goes back to sort of the, uh, um, you know, the idea of being in the market, being hedged, and and sort of things like that. So, yeah, I um, I so sorry, Derek. I might have lost you there for a second, but yes, um, for for us, you know, it's it's hard to beat the S and P five hundred, right? I think something like ninety five percent of managers don't beat the S and P five hundred over a ten year period. Um, so we we like to just start with that, right? It beats most managers. Okay, make that our base case. Let's start from there. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, you're, you're right, Derek, being hedged, being invested in the market, using the broader markets uh, as a means of, uh, uh, of the vehicle to deliver returns, um, but do it in a protected way. So the, you have the advantage of math, right? And uh, you don't have to pick uh, sectors. You don't have to count on the traditional, you know, uh, correlation or inverse correlation of different asset classes, right? Just mathematically define your risk up front. Really, it's the only thing you can control anyway. Uh, and then uh, uh, and invest in the vehicle that you think is going to give you the best odds to hit your goal. And we think that's the that's the U.S. stock market. You know, so is I'm, I'm doing an analogy on the fly. So for the audience, Jay and I were talking uh, the other day and I said, I was I forget what I was talking about. I'm sure it was very profound, uh, but I equated it to uh, taking a the, in hockey, you want to get shots on net because it can go in, the goalie can save it, it goes above the, uh, you know, a, a rebound off to the side, goes out of play. Jay, I think you pointed out in football, uh, third and long, throw a bomb, it gets completed, past interference, intercepted, um, you know, incomplete. Or, or with the Giants this year, um, you know, fumbles it in the backfield, gets picked up, and and yeah, but I. I wonder if there's an analogy with with a hedged equity strategy. It's kind of like you'll get the majority of the upside. So let's think of the outcomes, right? The majority of the upside. So that's one. What's the other ones, Jay? You can 
Uh, you'll be limited in your losses if the market has one of those major or moderate mar- uh, declines out of the blue, sure. So that's kind of like throwing an interception, but they get the ball at their own 10-yard line, right? Uh, right, um, right, right, right. You know, this, well, uh, this is... <laughs> I know we're going off the fly here, Derek, but you know, maybe uh, maybe this is where it came from. And and it's it's the chance or the, maybe the frequency that the market is up, right? Um, you can... You could find yourself when you're managing risk to being a little overly conservative. We talked about how bonds probably don't isn't worth the squeeze these days. Derek, did you know that over half the time, over the last hundred years, over half the time, the S and P is up more than fifteen percent? Right. So if you just looked at the calendar years, January to December, more than half the time it is up plus fifteen or more. Right. And so why would you not want to be exposed to that kind of a result? Right. We know you got to manage the risk. We know stocks can, you know, drop 35 percent in three and a half weeks like we saw February to March of this year. But why why not be exposed to that thing that, you know, more than half the time, just about it's just slightly more than half the time. It's up 15 percent or more. And by the way, another 20 percent of the time, it's it's a positive year, like two percent to plus 15. That's that's another 20 percent of the time. So 70 percent of the time, you know, stocks are going to be up to your liking and, you know, and it's going to help to help you hit, you know, on your growth targets. And so why not be exposed to that? I mean, that is the, uh, uh, you know, not everybody thinks that way because they think stocks are risky and we don't disagree with that. So just manage the risk and but have the upside opportunity. You know, there's something else uh, I'll kind of as we we wind down here that was fascinating. You pointed out to me and it was right in front of me, uh, but I think it was back to the, the value of being hedged. That's you know, this year, I think we ran, uh, we had some data, November, when was this? November 2nd. I forget the day. Data as of November 2nd. And year to date, the total return of the market was plus 2%, but we had a drawdown of 34%. And I didn't see this because I was, you know, in, in 2008, the drawdown was uh, 49% and we ended 38%. Go figure, right? But Jay, you pointed out to me another famous year on this chart that it's, you know, strikingly similar, exactly similar to this year. Exactly similar, right? And that year was 1987, uh, uh, where the market finished up 2%, but had a drawdown at one point of minus 34%. Yeah, exactly what it looked like. The exact same as this year. Yeah. The exact same. Hey, what happened the next year after that, after 87? uh, It was up 12. Up 12, yep. uh, Drawdown at 8. Yep. And, and the uh, to that was up 27, draw down to eight. Hey, there's a reason we've yep. picked 8%. Go figure. <laughs> this is our limit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, even look at it at 08, right? 08, 09. So 08 is the really bad year. 09 is plus 23, but you also had to experience another minus 28. Yeah. And, yep. you know, so that's, so we don't know what, what next year will bring. But when you showed that to me, I thought, wow, that's interesting. Because it was, you know, this year was short. But in the compression of time between, you know, the all-time high to, to the trough. But 87, I think, was even quicker, right? It was 20% over a week, I think, or several days. Black Monday, right? Black Monday drawdown was how much? 25 in a single day? You really can't get that. Oh, you're probably right. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the curbs will kick in and prevent that. Um, and by the way, I think the curbs really did prevent a deeper drop uh, this year. Right? You think so? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember it was one Sunday. You know, the futures were opening up. It was it was five p.m. It was Sunday. The futures were opening up. It was right after uh, one of the. It might have been uh, uh, Kashkari or it might have been Jay Powell came out and said, "We're going to do whatever it takes to support the market." Within three minutes, mon- within three minutes, the futures had limited down and shut down. Like enough for that session, right? So I just I do think that the curves helped quite a bit this year, uh, so that's good. Um, but you know you don't know when these kind of years are gonna 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 sneak up on you. I remember you know we were we were at a conference in January and it was you know yeah we heard about this thing in China, but to think about the impact of what it did to the to the you know financial markets in uh, February March was pretty dramatic. So when we say be hedged. You don't ever know when one of these things are gonna pop up on you. We'll continue to work on our uh, New York Giants football analogy. You know, that, that uh, analogy I, came off just as good as the Giants play. Yeah, not great. Not great. Not great. <laughs> we'll work on it. I don't, 
<laughs> we'll call Joe. I don't, I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if I'm a, a Daniel Jones fan or not. And I don't think it's fair. You know, he's had injuries and things like that. I don't know. It's tough. It's really tough. Like the Giants need a, a hedge strategy, right? They need some something strategy. I don't know. There's something for them, but um, I doubt they'll be in the playoffs this year. I doubt they'll be in the playoffs next year, but who knows, right? Um, we'll see. All right, Jay. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks again for coming on. And yeah, uh, thanks for having me again, Derek. Enjoyed the conversation as always. Yep. We, uh, as I always say, please share this with other people, uh, especially people who don't know what the heck a podcast is. Uh, keep an ear out next week. We should have a brand new guest on, uh, I think, that we're working on, which will be exciting. And uh, Jay, I'm sure you'll be back. We'll hopefully have you back before episode 100, but you'll definitely have to come back for that one for sure. Absolutely, Derek. Thanks again. Thanks, Jay. See you, everyone.